One very, very difficult traditional question in philosophy concerns what is good. What, and in particular, what is good for people. So uh, in the Western tradition, if you go back to Plato and Aristotle, uh, fundamental to their philosophy was an account of what's good for people. Uh, for Plato, it's a very complicated story in terms of what he calls the form of the good, the notion that there's some sort of an object of good out there in the world uh, and to the extent that we can participate in it, uh, link ourselves to it, that's what's going to be what's good. To explain Plato would be a much longer task than I can do here. Aristotle, at least apparently, gives us uh, a much simpler view of what's good. He maintains that uh, the good for individuals is happiness, which is something that seems plausible nowadays. Although by happiness, he didn't quite mean what we mean by happiness uh, in English nowadays. Uh, he meant something uh, more like an activity that was governed by people's rationality and which was something that people could, uh, could justify. So happiness was something active. The general question of what's good for people is one that hasn't gone away and it's one where there isn't any single dominant satisfactory uh, uh, account in the uh, philosophical literature. If one uh, jumps from uh, Aristotle uh, to the beginnings of modern philosophy, the uh, end of the Middle Ages, uh, one finds a, a very, very different view of well-being for example, in someone like Thomas Hobbes, uh, the uh, British philosopher, uh, he sees people as uh, endless, endlessly driven by their desires. He thinks of his appetites. Uh, he doesn't think of these as particularly uh, cog cognitively complex. And that what it is that makes for a successful life is your desires getting satisfied. That's what well-being is. And he also regards that's what happiness is. If if we succeed in getting what we want, we're happy. If we uh, don't succeed in getting what, what we want, we're unhappy, which contrasts uh, uh, drastically with Aristotle's view about uh, what happiness is. So Hobbes had the view that uh, happiness and well-being are simply a matter of getting people's uh, uh, des uh, desires satisfied. A much more sophisticated version of that view is still a, uh, a, a very important view in, contempor in contemporary philosophy. The simple view that Hobbes has, that we simply want to satisfy people's desires, whatever they are, is far too simple. Because sometimes we want things be, uh, because we have uh, mistaken beliefs. We may think that a, a particular dish would be extremely delicious and nourishing and in fact because of an allergy it's fatal to us. And because we had a false belief we wanted something that was in fact bad for us. And clearly people can want things that are bad for themselves. I certainly have wanted things in the past that it turned out when I got them really didn't make my life better. Uh, so what one can do with respect to a desire satisfaction theory of the sort that Hobbes has is to say, well, let's clean up people's desires. Let's think about what people would desire if they didn't have false beliefs, if they were able to take time to think carefully, uh, if they were focused on themselves rather than other people. And so we can say, perhaps we can say that well-being is, is the satisfaction of these cleaned up desires or preferences. So that's one of the currently dominant views. Another one of those views sounds as if it harkens back to Aristotle because it says that well-being is happiness, but rather than given what Aristotle meant by happiness, it's really rather different than Aristotle's view. It's the view that basically what we're looking for is um, the right mental states, and the right mental states are what makes us better off. So if you look at someone like Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th and early 19th century who was the founder of so-called utilitarianism, in his view, uh, well-being is simply pleasure and the absence of pain. But 
there's lots of different kinds of pleasures. There's enormously different pleasures. Uh, the pleasure one gets if one is a, a lover of classical music and listens to a Tchaikovsky symphony is going to be very different than the kind of pleasure one gets from eating a really, really uh, 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 delicious dessert or from drinking a glass of vodka. The, these are different kinds of pleasures. And similarly, pains. If you think of something like dizziness, dizziness isn't painful, but it's clearly a very unpleasant experience. And so we have this tremendous heterogeneity of pleasures and pains, and it's not exactly clear what this theory of well-being would be. Moreover, this theory of well-being faces what is to me a really decisive objection, and that is it says that well-being is simply a matter of your mental states. It has nothing to do with reality. And so you can have two individuals whose mental states are just the same. Both of them think that their lives are going wonderful, that their, chil uh, that their children are thriving in school, that their co-workers respect them, one of whom is completely true. The other is just deceived. His children are taking drugs, his wife is sleeping with other people, his co-workers uh, uh, hate him, make fun of him behind his back. And the notion of these two people's lives are just as good because their mental states are just as good, from my perspective, th that really misses what we're concerned with when we're concerned with the theory of well-being. A third theory of well-being, I'll go back to a desire satisfaction theory in a moment, a third theory of well-being in some ways is, is much more satisfactory and in some ways is utterly unsatisfactory. And that is, uh, there are so-called objective list theories of well-being. So what's well-being? It consists in being healthy, it consists in uh, having a good mental state, it consists in uh, succeeding in important uh, activities that one's concerned with, uh, it certainly consists in uh, having friends and having friends for whom terrible tragedies don't happen. So we can list a number of things like that. But it's pretty unsatisfactory as a philosophical theory because it's obvious that different mixtures of these goods are good for different people. There are some people for whom friendship is really what life is all about. There are other people for whom friendship is very, very unimportant. Even if it has a role in everyone's life, how big a role it has is going to differ enormously. And so we don't really have a theory about what makes individuals' lives well-being. We have a list of the ingredients, but we exactly uh, how to cook those ingredients, how to make uh, a good life out of those ingredients, we have nothing in this theory at all, and so we really don't have a theory of well-being. Now, Going back to the preference satisfaction theory, many philosophers think that if we clean up preferences, then we have a satisfactory uh, theory of well-being. In my view, that's really not the case, because I think one really needs to take seriously the first-person perspective. If one thinks about making choices oneself, and if one thinks about forming one's preferences, so uh, you know those. Uh, people who are at the age of 18 or 20 are deciding on what career that uh, they want to have. And the way people make decisions isn't to say, gee, what are my preferences uh, among careers? That's exactly what I need to answer. I want to know what my preferences among careers are. And so I think, well, this career has these features and those features, and which of these is better for me? And I'm not asking which of these do I already prefer, I'm asking which of these should I prefer, which of these, uh, in terms of the properties and my value judgments concerning those properties, which of these do I think would, all things considered, or if I'm self-interested with respect to just me, which of these would, would be better? And the notion of betterness there is some other notion. And so I don't think that, I think that the, account that it's simply preference satisfaction tells us how we can learn about other people's views about what's good for them, but doesn't give us a theory about what actually is good for, uh, for people. Now, at this point you might say, well, he's given us a really discouraging picture. 
uh, that all the philosophical theories of well-being are faulty, none of them are much good, which is in fact my view. But you might say, well, how in the world do we even know what well-being is then if none of the philosophical theories are any good? Well, if people needed a good philosophical theory of well-being to have any idea about what makes for a good life, no one would have any idea what makes for a good life because I don't think there is a satisfactory theory. But on the other hand, in everyday life, we uh, accept what I would call a kind of folk theory of well-being. It's not a satisfactory uh, philosophical theory. In lots of ways it's sort of like the, what I call the objective list theory, but it doesn't have any great philosophical pretenses. It's rather that if we see somebody who's suddenly become uh, extremely ill, they've been diagnosed with cancer or whatever, we judge that their life has, gone, is, has taken a turn for the worse. If we later discover the person is cured, we see the person's life has taken a, a turn for the better because we think that health is an important constituent of well-being. How important, what the general notion is, we don't know, but we've got, we've got a bunch of what one might call platitudes concerning well-being. Uh, if you get along well with your friends, your life is, uh, if, is better. If you feel better, your life is better. Uh, if you manage to uh, have someone who's really important to you, either within your family or uh, just a really close friend, those are the sorts of things that make life better. So I think that's where we are. Those things provide a touchstone on the basis of which we can assess different theories of well-being, but I don't think we have anything like a satisfactory theory of well-being.